and welcome, welcome, welcome again to Code Lab on Tinker Live. Uh, this is the show that helps students and teachers make and create with Tinker Code. Uh, I am so excited today because today is day three of Computer Science Education Week, and millions of students all over the world are celebrating Hour of Code as we speak. Uh, now, yesterday we had uh, created a lunar habitat with two of NASA's aerospace engineers that work specifically with lunar modules. It was like a really great day. And, but today is even better because we have two aerospace engineers. They have a great story about how they got to NASA, which I hope they share. Um, so in the next 40 minutes or so, uh, we are going to meet and uh, be welcomed by some amazing people. These two amazing people, Melanie Grande and Ryan Joyce. Uh, we are then going to go ahead and do the lunar test drive. Uh, so this is going to be a great chance for students to uh, talk to our or, or uh, see our master tinker trainer, uh, Mr. Lockhart is going to come and show us how to do this project. Uh, and, and we're going to get insight from NASA on how to uh, how to think about it, think like a scientist would uh, when doing this project. Now, you can also chat with us. You can ask questions of our NASA scientists. So please uh, go to go tinker slash live chat. That's G-O-T-Y-N dot K-R slash live chat. We have a Padlet there. It's moderated. Uh, please don't use your names. That You won't get your question uh, featured. Uh, but we'll do that right at the end of the show. Uh, and so teachers, if you are a Twitterer or a tweeter uh, and you wanna share the joy of what you're doing with, uh, with Hour of Code and NASA today, uh, just hold your uh, device up to that QR code and tweet it out. It's gonna be amazing. And everyone, uh, you know, just share the joy with your, uh, with your network. Uh, we would love for you to do that. So who am I? I'm Daniel Rizek and uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm one of the uh, senior leads here at Tinker. I'm a former science teacher, tech coach, uh, tech director, uh, and I'm really excited. Oh, there I am. I'm really excited to share this with you uh, as well as being a former science teacher to have NASA folks on. Uh, this is a real treat for me as well. Now, today we're doing lunar test drives as part of Hour of Code Week. We have a lot of great uh, NASA-inspired projects uh, and this is the agenda. We're going to get to know our guests a little bit. We're going to understand our project. Uh, then we're going to create. And then we're going to do a little Q&A with our NASA guests. So notice I have this really cool background. I want to make sure you guys know at the end of today's show, you're going to get a link to download six special Tinker backgrounds uh, that you're going to love. So let's get started, guys. Um, let's get started. I want to just show you guys there's two ways to log in. You're going to know how to get to the project. And you want to know how to get to the NASA stuff. Uh, so we're going to start by just getting you signed in. And if you're a student, you want to sign in up there in the top. Uh, you want to go ahead and sign in as a student at tinker.com. You're going to go and sign in you know, one of few ways, whether Google or Tinker or the Tinker Smart Pass. Now, when you go to your class, you can then see a little folder that says Hour of Code. And you could get to the NASA projects just uh, by going to the Hour of Code folder. And inside that folder, you're going to see all the NASA projects uh, there. And you can click on Lunar Test Drive. You can also just go to tinker.com slash NASA and click on Lunar Test Drive. It's in the top left of your screen, not that arrow right there. Uh, but uh, that's how you get to the projects. We just want to make sure you can save your work, which is why we highly recommend signing in. So that will bring me to uh, our special guest today. Now, the first person I'm going to introduce today is Melanie Grande. Uh, Melanie is, uh, she grew up in Southern Florida, went to college at Purdue University, where she studied aerospace engineering. She started NASA um, at the Langley Research Center. And she went through the Pathways program, which I hope she'll talk about in a little uh, moment here. Uh, and then went to work for full time uh, for NASA after she graduated. She focuses on human exploration of the moon and Mars, including mission design, spacecraft design, and systems engineering. So welcome to Code Lab, uh, Melanie. So great to have you uh, as part of the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, and we're going to have some fun. Uh, this is uh, uh, kind of new for us, but uh, it's been really great to hear kind of how science can really inform these projects. And I know you you guys are like the specialists, so you're going to have some great uh, insights for us as we do our lunar test drive. Uh, now, I don't want to keep uh, Ryan waiting because I also have, we have another special guest, uh, which is Ryan Joyce. Uh, Ryan uh, is, uh, he grew up in Pennsylvania, 
went to uh, the University of Maryland, graduated with aerospace engineering degree, and also went through the Pathways program, uh, internship program uh, at NASA, which uh, uh, is just sounds exciting. And if I were a student right now, I'd be like Googling Pathways right now. Um, but he worked on Gateway, Mars planning, and now the human landing system, uh, where his job is to ensure landers uh, are capable of transporting crew from lunar orbit down to moon surface, surface and then back to lunar orbit. It's a big job, uh, but uh, we are so excited to have Ryan Joyce uh, on the show. Uh, so Ryan, welcome. Welcome to uh, Code Lab. Thank you. Really happy to be here. So Melanie, it Ryan. Very exciting. Oh yeah. Well, I'm very, you know, I'm very excited. <laughs> um, Melanie, I want to kind of get to know you guys just a little bit. Uh, so Melanie, why don't you, uh, if you have your cameras, I like keep your cameras on guys. Cause we're going to, we're going to, we want to see your, your faces. Um, Melanie, want to start with you. Just kind of give us a little bit of an idea as to um, uh, what kind of brought you to NASA and kind of how, you know, how your role fits in with um, the kind of moon to Mars program. Yeah, sure. So um, I had heard about the Pathways internships while I was a student at Purdue and um, I applied and got a, uh, got a job there as a Pathways when I was a senior uh, at, in college and actually stayed through uh, being a master's student in graduate school. And so what I what I've worked on at first was actually uh, exploration of Mars. And now I'm working with NASA's Artemis program to help make sure that we can send the next human landing system to the surface of the moon. And so that is going to be the actual vehicle that transports the crew from lunar orbit to the surface of the moon and there's just a lot of challenges involved with trying to transport crew versus if we were just transporting science payloads it's a it's a lot bigger effort and we want to make sure that it's going to be very safe so that's just kind of what my job has to do with right now that sounds awesome uh, and so ryan tell us uh, uh how did you you know it's, we know a little bit about uh how you got to nasa but kind of tell us a little bit more about your role as well that'd be awesome to know Sure. Uh, I'm also highly involved in the Artemis program. Um, back when we were creating the concept of the gateway, uh, which is uh, the basically the, the lunar command module, as our administrator likes to call it, uh, where people will stay in orbit around the moon for up to maybe 30 days or so in initial missions and then evolve to a longer capability of orbiting around the moon. Um, so I was involved in helping uh, come up with those habitat concepts and working with our partners in the industry uh, to come up with what, what those plans might be. And then lately I've shifted over to helping define the human landing system, which you talked a little bit about in uh, my bio. And uh, yeah, that's all about how we get crew safely to and from the, the gateway or the Orion command module, which will be you know, out in lunar orbit. Well, this is wonderful because uh, this will kind of help set up our project uh, really nicely. Uh, and, you know, I couldn't have better you know, guests on right now to kind of help us understand uh, this, uh, this project. And so I guess the kind of the big question that I have to kind of start off is kind of what should students know, uh, you know, about human landing systems and kind of how might they tie into uh, you know, where, their role, uh, you know, uh, on, on the moon and whatnot. Uh, Melanie, why don't we uh, go ahead and, and, and we'll start with you. Uh, and I do have some, I have some slides here. I don't know if you want me to go ahead and, uh, and present those now. I can do that. Oh, we, we need your audio. Of, there we go. Of course. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. You're definitely, we can present the slides. Sure. Um, but just to answer your question first, I think what comes to mind is that there's so many ways of sending humans or robotic rovers to the surface of the moon. There's no single right answer. And I think that's really fun, especially I can remember when I was a student, you know, you're trying to come up with that right answer that your teacher is looking for. But when uh, you're an engineer or a scientist, um, or in so many different jobs and, or when you're working for this human landing system for NASA, there's so many creative ways of doing it. And so right now we have three partners who are doing it three completely separate ways that are competing in order to get the contracts for NASA to basically agree to send our astronauts with them. And so it's just fun to see how those different designs are developing over time. 
Amazing. Yeah. So um, can you kind of uh, maybe you should go ahead and walk us through uh, this, uh, these slides and, and just tell me, you know, I'm kind of pointing them in the right direction or not, but, uh, um, and if you both want to kind of talk about these, that's totally fine, but uh, um, uh, help us yeah. understand. Sure. So, I mean, landing people back on the moon is a pretty complicated and, you know, challenging task. And like Melanie said, we've got a couple of different approaches uh, and concepts out there with, with our partners. Each one is very different and they might have very different ways of actually landing some cargo on the surface, like you can see in this image. And cargo might be all manner of things. It might be a lunar habitat. It might be a human capable lunar rover, like you can see in the middle of this image mm -hmm. with two astronauts outside exploring on the lunar surface. Or it might be some of these smaller rovers that uh, help astronauts get around inside of their spacesuits, like the rover on the right hand side of this image. And, you know, rovers are really interesting, especially in the context of this activity, because when you're in a spacesuit, it's kind of hard to get around on the surface of the moon. And you want to be able to check out all sorts of different locations, right? You right. don't want to be too, too pinned to your lander location. You want to be able to explore around and see a lot of different things. And so in the context of human exploration, having a, a rover on the lunar surface helps your astronauts get to much more variety of sites where they might be able to learn a lot more interesting things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we've got a lot of really interesting concepts and great artists who work at uh, you know NASA too. And um, I mean, this is just a beautiful shot of uh, what it might look like to stand on the lunar surface and imagine yourself in the astronaut's shoes. Uh, and we're hopeful that you know we can bring the the community with uh, those astronauts and really share this experience with everybody on Earth too. Yeah, I also noticed, you know, just it's so nice to see, you know, the future of space suit design as well. I think that's another thing that's just kind of nice because for many, you know, for all of us who've watched science fiction uh, for so many years, uh, to kind of see that uh, come to fruition is really cool. So what is this? So this so, is a view. Oh, so Melanie, go, ahead, no. go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Ryan. All right, I'll turn it over to you right after this one. Uh, so this is a view of two astronauts, you know, driving back with the uh, to the lander inside of a it looks like the unpressurized rover, and uh, you're seeing a, a sample of what their display might look like in front of them and their command station. Uh, it looks like the astronaut on the left has their hand on their driving controls, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see the it's some pretty interesting and challenging lighting conditions with the sun being really close to the horizon which is gonna be one of the challenges of landing on the, the lunar south pole, which is where we're currently planning to land. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in there and point out that um, though this is what is going to be actually happening on the moon, it takes a lot of preparation to actually get to this point. We, also, we actually have some uh, engineers here at NASA Langley in Virginia who are designing simulations uh, using coding and software and all kinds of you know, STEM experiences and knowledge, as well as artistry, as you can see, like there's, um, there's these really awesome graphics here in order to design the simulations that help um, both astronauts practice to be able to drive on the lunar surface, as well as um, design the software that will actually be on the rovers. Um, we need to have terrain, uh, terrain avoidance software on the rovers to help avoid craters and boulders. Mm. Um, also the software, you know, that just, it's the whole brains of the rover. So I just wanted to point out, especially like here at this tinker hour of code, how important code is to our whole, to our whole mission on the moon. Yeah. Wow. And you can go to the next slide. Sure. And uh, this is just a great picture. I love it. It's a picture of a couple engineers uh, standing in front of the Curiosity rover on uh, which would eventually go to Mars. And uh, you know, the going to the moon is partially so we can prepare to go to Mars in the future. And we're, we're getting a lot of experience with how we do the simulations. We're getting experience with how we avoid obstacles. Um, we're getting experience uh, doing remote driving of the rover so we can actually send commands via coding and software from Earth ground stations to the rovers on the moon or on Mars 
So we're sending them to Curiosity, which is on Mars right now. And so we're, wow. we're gathering all of this experience so on Mars with robotic rovers, and then we can take it to the moon with robotic and crewed rovers, and then back to Mars again, and then on to different uh, destinations. So it's just this huge effort and there's just a lot of people involved and we're just, uh, it's, it's really exciting to see how people are using their different strengths at NASA in different ways. Yeah, so many, so much uh, time and, and uh, brain effort involved here. This is, uh, this is awesome. Um, so I think we have time for one more and then we're gonna get to our project. Uh, Ryan, what are, we, what are we seeing here? Yeah, so this is a, a, a picture of the Mars rover uh, on the surface. Uh, it's, it looks like it's got its arm extended with uh, potentially the sampling mechanism or the, the sampling tool it, trying to take a rock sample mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, probably put it back inside of the uh, inside of the sample collection and, you know, where we can learn about it. But what's really interesting here uh, from a coding perspective is controlling an arm, a robotic arm like that is really, really difficult task. And it requires a lot of software to be able to do it. And if you think about some of the other th aspects and, and maybe in the context of the, the task you're going to do today, I mean, you got to figure out how to move the, the rover around on Mars without actually being able to see, you know, where you're located. You've got to figure out navigation solutions and com send com commands to the wheels and the camera to look in certain directions. And, you know, any aspect of the coding activity you're going to do today actually kind of applies to, you know, what real NASA software engineers and uh, and experts are using to control the Mars rover. So that actually brings up some really uh, interesting ideas because uh, that will, I think, very much inform uh, what our, uh, our educator support coach uh, is going to need to, to do when he helps us through this project. Uh, so I wanna invite uh, Mr. Lockhart to the conversation. Uh, Mr. Lockhart is uh, you know, one of our, our uh, master tinkerers and uh, he's been uh, he's been with us helping teachers and students all over the world learn uh, tinker and um, and so thinking I'm gonna I'm gonna pause as you do the project but uh, um, I, just because I want to see a little bit more uh, I want to use a little bit of some of the uh, ideas that you guys introduced uh, but we're this is kind of like a basic project here but I maybe Mr. Lockhart's got some other ideas for us uh, when it comes to this project. Uh, but uh, but welcome, Mr. Lockhart. Hello. And, uh, and Mr. Rizak, can you uh, give me some screen sharing permissions, friend? Um, I can. Oh, interesting that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, no problem. Perfect. All right. Now let's kick over to the project. All right, so the project today is about lunar test drive. And so kind of the idea that we're gonna do here is we're gonna kind of take that surface of the moon and use kind of the stage editor and Tinker. And we're gonna do, we can do a lot of different things with this. We can tell a story, we can make a game. And so like a lot of the Tinker projects it, the, and especially some of our NASA projects, this one's a little bit more open-ended for you to be really creative. Mm -hmm. And so you have this tutorial over here and we'll kind of go, we'll kind of skip kind of through the steps, but we'll kind of talk through them rather than look at the tutorial. Um, but the first step is they want you to kind of create here and kind of create the surface and the kind of uh, that you're going to use. And there's lots of different pieces in here that we can kind of, we can go and use and we can use as things that we can pull out and things that we can use even to make a maze game with the lunar ro with the rover. And so one of the coolest things here is that one of the pieces that you have is that you can actually go and pick up here, up here on the left side, mm -hmm. where it has this little kind of art, this little block, you can actually pick kind of bricks out. And they can be very similar to like, if I pulled out levels on Super Mario, and what's right. cool is I can build out like rocks. Um, I can build out like trenches here and really it's whatever you want it to be. And you can actually kind of move this to being a maze uh, for the lunar rover. And so what we're going to kind of go through here, but again, you can take this project any way that you want is that we want to kind of make this a game that says, okay, here are the instructions. We want you to get to the dish and move the rover over to the dish. And so one of the things that you can do is you can add say blocks onto the, um stage actor 
And once I add that save block onto the stage actor, when I hit play, it's actually gonna give me that kind of bigger direction. Um, then I can go and actually use the rover and play the game. If I kind of move to that next piece, the next thing piece is we wanna go um, and program something to react when the rover touches it. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna cut, just say for now, we'll say like, you know, the slide, the, uh, we want the rover to touch the satellite dish and say success. And so now as the rover gets over there and I, I, and also in that stage editor, I forgot this part, you can add like lunar bases and uh, satellite dishes and solar panels. And there's all kinds of pieces there that you can add. Um, if I come back over here, where if I come over to the actors, there's another rover you can add, but there's all of these bases that I can add in here too. So I could add, We'll add the garden. We can add kind of labs in. I missed that part. I got too excited with the art. No, that's okay. Which is rare um, for me. What I also noticed too, I think if you if you do go back to the code side, yeah. you can add uh, media, and then there's just like a there's a hundreds of like things you can add there. Absolutely. Um, so if you go over to add actor, and right. you go to the media library. And there is a full space uh, category. You go down, it's NS, so you go down to space and there's all kinds of astronauts and buildings and moon and satellite and pretty much any, the big rovers like they were talking about, you can add yeah. those, the, you can add those in as well. And then it's just a matter of coding them all to kind of interact. Cool. All right, so when we look kind of at the code that we're doing, so the whole goal here is that when the when the rover touches the satellite dish, it's gonna give us a success. And then one of the things that you wanna to do too, if you're building a maze, is you actually wanna program these, uh, these obstacles to be static. Because if you don't, what's gonna end up happening is that when the rover hits them, it'll just drive over them. And so this is all kind of centered around our physics blocks, um, where if I go to the stage, We've already started physics here. That was already mm -hmm. kind of pre-programmed in. Right. But if I come back to, we'll just say the small rock and I add on start and I add the set active and the set static, it's basically what it's gonna do is it's gonna tell the rock that you are a static image. So if I drive the rover that way, it's gonna go and it's not gonna roll over it. And then the biggest thing here is what everybody's gonna wanna do is how do you actually get this rover to move? And what's really neat about our rover in Tinker is that you have a whole category of blocks that are centered around the rover. So this makes it super, super easy to do where I can go and I can say, I can change the speed, I can change the directions, um, I can go and just have it move forward. And so some of the code that you can add is something like when I up arrow start, when I press up arrow, I can come back to the rover and I could do something as simple as say, I'm going to move the rover. I'm going to point the rover up and then I'm going to move the rover. And so now when I press play and I press that up arrow, the rover starts to move. And so all you have to really do to kind of program the rover through is that you could go and use the other directions where you could use a right arrow or a left arrow and a down arrow. And what's really cool also about the rover, and this is kind of one of the things that I like as well, is that you also have kind of things that the rover will do. Mm -hmm. So you can take a rover sample, you can take a rover picture, um, really neat ways to kind of get that rover interacting. And so it's just a matter of building out your game and your levels to really make this super creative. So let's do an okay stop there for just a minute because I, I know we want to come back. Uh, but there's one thing that, you know, uh, Ryan, I think you had mentioned uh, before. And that was, you know, or, or maybe it was Melanie. Um, maybe it was Melanie. But one of you mentioned about, you know, perhaps, you know, we may need to basically, we have programmers on Earth sending scripts to basically programs to uh, some of our um, uh, rovers that are up there already. Uh, what, just in this initial setup, what are you seeing right now? What are you thinking? Oh, they should... They should program it to do this. They should they should make it go, you know, and, and do this particular job. What what should they do? Oh, uh, I'm not. 
I'm not sure. I think there's uh, so many options. I, I think I'd like to see if uh, maybe how far out can they go and maybe uh, come back, maybe like explore like a wide radius if possible. Um, I think that'd be interesting. All right. What tasks, Ryan? Like, uh, can they go to the greenhouse and pick flowers or something? I don't know. <laughs> uh, what's, uh, what's a good task well, for, uh, for the rovers? Yeah, well, there's a lot, of, a couple of different tasks. Uh, I mean, so already in the examples we've seen, taking samples is a great thing. And that's something all of our rovers typically do because you want to learn about the lunar environment. And, you know, moving over to a communications dish, maybe so your uh, rover can do some repairs while, uh, you know, astronauts aren't on the surface. So your rover can actually do some of those repairs. Uh, and then moving over to a specific location, say, yeah, the greenhouse, and then taking a sample there. Maybe, maybe you actually can get inside the greenhouse with your rover. I like it. David, what do you think? Are you going to show us some, uh, a couple more things before, uh, before we move on to Q&A? Got to have your audio. Here we go. Sorry, it, mo it moves. It moves my bar when I share my screen, and it took me a second. No problem. Uh, so one of the things that you can do to make this movement really, really easy is I can sit here and I can say, "All right, I'm going to copy this," and I can. All you have to do is basically click on it where it's white, and then you can just use it copy and paste as well. So now I can sit there and go, "All right, here's how I'm going to do my left." And sorry if you hear my children stomping upstairs. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it is what uh, it is. Yeah, well, yeah, the, and Wednesdays are always the days they're actually here. So um, because they're on virtual school on Wednesdays, but um, so you can kind of do it that way too. And then I think a way that you could really make this kind of stand out is going back to that satellite dish. You could do stuff like when it's uh, when it's touching rover. Um, you could actually use that wind touching block to use rover when it's touching the satellite dish. That's where it takes a picture when it goes over sure. to the greenhouse that's where it takes a sample and what you can actually do to make this really easy is if i take this and i just pull this block onto rover it's actually going to make a copy of this and so all i would want to do is go okay i'm going to say i don't know when it touches the small rock we can get rid of this say success block for now we can say all right let's take have the rover take a sample instead so now you're programming that interaction between the rover and stuff within your game within your story whatever you want it to be that's great and and so melanie do you is there anything like just in the setup there that you're thinking oh well you know uh they have they're not going to have greenhouses or, or, or are, there, are there certain buildings that the kids, you know, students should be like, oh, well, you know, they have to have this and uh, they don't have that. So uh, maybe is there something that we, they should be thinking about uh, on the moon that uh, things that are just necessities? Sure. So, I mean, I think a greenhouse is a fantastic idea. I think that's maybe a little bit farther down the road as far as NASA plans are going. But a lot of the concepts that we're seeing, they probably are, we're going to need to have um, bigger power sources. Um, so Ooh, I don't know like if you can model some PowerPoint. power sources in there. Yeah, definitely. But the communications um, antenna, that's, I think, a really good thing, too. I think it's a it's a challenge for the elements that are on the surface to communicate with the satellites that are uh, in lunar orbit and back on Earth. So that's something that I'm seeing that's a really good idea there. Great. Anything else, Ryan, that you just noticed that was like, eh, you know, got to have yeah, power. I mean, right? Yes, solar panels are what we're typically considering uh, for the lunar surface. Uh, power is great. But uh, habitats, any place for, you know, your crew to take their spacesuits off and, and, you know, actually be able to be in a shirt sleeve, comfortable environment. Uh, is also great. And you know, they're going to want to be looking at samples and doing analysis to try and, you know, learn more things about the moon. So laboratories are great as well. Awesome. So uh, just for our students that are out there, teachers right now, you can submit questions. Uh, if you go to gotinker slash live chat, uh, you can ask a question there and we're featuring uh, questions here. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to some of the questions that, uh, that we have. Uh, question number, oh, it always starts on the wrong slide, doesn't it, with that? I'm going to go back a little bit. So let's start with this. How long does it take for a rover to get to Mars? And once they're up there, do they ever come back down? Who 
who wants to take that ryan or melanie uh, i can take it um okay. it takes a pretty long time to, to get to mars generally um most often we're sending things on pretty slow transfers because it's uh it's efficient and it helps us get more uh, more mass or science you know a, a larger rover down to the surface and uh, it can take up to a year to transfer there um, in, in current plans. And sometimes it can take even longer if you want to get ev uh, you know, even a little bit larger rover down to the surface. Uh, in those cases, it might even take two years to get to Mars. Uh, but typically, one year is you know, pretty average. Um, and currently, you know, nothing has ever returned from Mars. Uh, it, it takes a lot of energy to move something out to Mars in the first place. And to be able to return it from there requires, you know, even more. So, ah, um, so yeah. if this is like they say in those science fiction movies, this is a one way trip. Right, right now, <laughs> we, we are working hard to make it a two way trip, though, for humans soon. Oh, good, good. No, that's good. Um, but for humans, not for the you know stuff that we bring over there. Yeah, so, not typically actually, for rovers. Oh, I'm sorry. But yeah, go, go ahead, Mel. I was going to say, actually, NASA is working on a Mars sample return mission right now. So um, that would be the hmm. first time we've ever actually returned something from Mars, which is really exciting. Actually, um, the Japanese Space Agency um, has just returned a sample from an asteroid, and NASA is going to do that again soon, too. So that's one of the first times we've been able to return samples from another celestial body. But um, we are working really hard on coming up with a concept to do a Mars sample return as well. Um, and like I was actually going to add too, um, what Ryan's saying is that it changes um, how long it takes to get to Mars. Um, that is, first of all, dependent on how much power you have with your rocket, but also it's it's all about the alignment of the planets. And so the moon and Mars relative to the sun are always moving kind of like closer and farther away from each other. And if mm -hmm. you time it just right, you can time it so that moon or sorry, that the Mars that Mars and Earth are closest to each other. And that's how you can have the shortest trajectory possible. And then how long you stay on Mars is also gonna depend on how long it's gonna take to get back. Because if you stay too long, maybe Mars and Earth are getting far away again from each other. So I, it's just a really interesting So there's a lot problem. to think of there, right? Cause then, yeah, uh, the, the trip back's gonna be a lot longer. Um, Definitely. So here's a question, and yeah, this is this comes from something that you had mentioned. Uh, how does code travel from Earth to Mars? Uh, it's such a long distance. <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting question. So we um, have uh, stations here on Earth that are full of computers, and we have satellites uh, in Earth orbit uh, that are, you know, also have computers on board and. Then uh, all the way out at Mars, we might have either just the rover on the surface or we might have like a communications relay in orbit. And so imagine if we have that communications relay, the computer is sending via radio waves the, commu the communications from Earth's ground stations to the Earth lunar orbit relay station to the Mars orbit relay station down to the surface so the rover can hear um, what commands that we want to give it or um, what requests we're having for what samples sure. to collect or, you know, what a couple inches we want it to move. And then it actually has to get sent all the way back from that rover to the Mars or orbit relay to the Earth orbit relay down to the ground stations again. And that I think can take a, um, I think, I think it's seven minutes, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong here, seven minutes one way, just because of uh, the limit of the speed of light and the, just that really far distance. Yeah, and it can so. get up to as long as 22 minutes one way. Interesting. I wonder what uh, what creates the difference. Uh, is it just the distance from you know the where Earth? Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Got to be. We have to be done with radio by now, don't we? Isn't it time? Like, can't we like beam a laser? You know, and send <laughs> information that way, or you know, there's got to be a new way. That yeah, we're working on we're working on laser communications. Uh, that's one of like the technologies that NASA is investing in developing over the next few years. And I think we've already um, demonstrated it on a small scale, both on Earth and in space. So hopefully that will be coming soon. Yeah, well, one of the a... challenges with that is the precision. You, you got to be really, really, really accurate. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like, uh, um, 
but it's exciting. It is really exciting to finally, you know, hear a lot of that science fiction stuff that we've heard about for many years. And now it feels like we're actually doing it. So we do have a question and I, I, don't, I don't know if you can kind of bring in a little bit of the pathways program, but uh, cause I'm sure, you know, I want to send a link to students, you know, when we're done, like, here's where you go. And uh, how do you, how did you feel when you first got to NASA? Were you nervous or excited? Ryan, do you want to take that? Sure, I can start, but I, it'd be fun to have Melanie share her experience too. Uh, I was definitely both. <laughs> uh, I was very excited. I've, I've been very interested in human space flight for, you know, since high school. And uh, it was really exciting to be able to start actually, you know, contributing to the efforts of the space program once I actually made it to NASA. Uh, but I was also a little nervous because, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And you got to, you know, make sure you get the math and, and the programs and coding right when you do it for your job. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good, that's a good point. Well, how is it for you, Melanie? I completely agree. I was both nervous and excited. Uh, I've also been interested in space exploration for a really long time. And I remember uh, sitting in meetings and there was posters of, you know, like Star Wars and Star Trek and uh, Firefly, if anyone's watched Firefly, oh, yeah. like Serenity. in our conference room. Yeah, so it was like so cool. You know, that's really exciting. Um, you're like, oh, just a bunch of people who love space. But um, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's nervous too. Um, I'm part of this group called Allies and Advocates for Women here at NASA who are, we're able to support each other, but um, to some degree, I think a lot of women deal with an imposter syndrome, and that's certainly true for me as well. Um, you know, it's like, do like, do I really belong here? You know, like, am I smart enough to work at NASA? And I think it's just a uh, slowly over time you find uh, ways that you're able to contribute and you feel more confident, and uh, you know, you just have to keep uh, being as confident as you can in yourself and learning as much as possible. And I think that that's a just a I guess a challenge in life that we all have to work at sometimes. Sure. Um, well, that is actually all the qu time we have for questions for today, but I want to thank you guys uh, so much for your insights and uh, for, uh, for joining us today. We have a little bit of resources we want to share with students before uh, we are done uh, today. Uh, but uh, again, thank you guys for your insights. And I know that we're gonna, students are going to share projects with us. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, you know, like, look what I did. And it's because Melanie told us that you had to code from Earth or, or you know, like, and uh, that they do that all the time. So it's really fun. Uh, but let me go ahead and, and uh, uh, give you guys uh, who are watching just a, a little bit of resources on the way out. Uh, and that is just tomorrow. Um, you know, you can see it again. We're going we're gonna to be doing another uh, great show tomorrow. And if you want to add Thursday and Friday onto your, your schedule, uh, just go to that link, uh, go tinker slash NASA HOC 20. And guess what? You can pause the video and write it down or type it in because uh, you can do that uh, in, uh, in these YouTube videos. So tomorrow we're going to be doing a, the Lunar Gateway story. And we're going to be uh, bringing again, uh, some some amazing NASA guests uh, but that are going to help us. This was a little more challenging, a little more advanced. We're going to be using JavaScript uh, with this. And so we're going to be bringing, again, two uh, a NASA aerospace technologists and an engineer tomorrow. Uh, also, uh, if you want to have a little extra fun in Hour of Code, you, everybody should try the Holiday Code Jam. Uh, and you can go to gotinker slash holiday code jam. And not only will you build projects, but you can also submit them and win, you know, fabulous prizes for your classroom. And, and so that's a lot of fun. So I highly recommend uh, that you guys try that. And then I told you I would give you the virtual backgrounds. And so there are six awesome ones here. Uh, students go to gotinker slash virtual backgrounds. And again, if you need to write that down, just pause the video, write it down, then play, and then we're all good to go. Um, but uh, once again, thank you to Melanie and Ryan. Uh, really appreciate both of you and your insights and your inspiration for students all over the world. Trust me, students from you know India and Australia will email us and they'll say, "Oh my gosh, I, I'm so excited to uh, uh, to hear their stories." Uh, so thank you once again. Uh, but that is going to do it for us today on Code Lab. We're going to see you again uh, tomorrow.